Austin now. That's what I'm here for. That's awesome. I'm sure Michael Love would love that. Michael Bay is like, oh, we have grades. Did it go well though with the, with the clip? Yes, I'm not going to pull this out of here. That's not good terminology. As you can tell, I got a lot of good at all the time growing campus. And a uh, little pregnant is in abundance on all campuses. Um, but I'm not. So don't expect that for me here. If I bend anybody with what I say, get over it. <laughs> 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 what I'm going to do. Well, again, my name is Chris Salam. I was uh, with the Global Spot staff. I know they said services, but I don't know why he said that, and they kept it in, and kept it in, the, uh, in that little feature. Right? Global Spot staff is what we're called. Um, I worked with the CIA prior to being on for seven years. Before that, I was a contractor for three. Before that, I was a ranger with the 7th Grand Regiment, and with, uh, as an officer with OBA, Operational Attachment Alpha 993, uh, special Forces team. So, myself and I know, you know, this is, you guys want to know about Glenn a little bit as well. I served with Glenn with the agency. I worked with him in Triple before Benghazi. And uh, just give you a background, background on Glenn before we started in the night. You know, Glenn actually, uh, for an Navy SEAL, he actually prepared a lot. He actually went through that game. <laughs> he actually took planning seriously. Yeah, I did have that planning cell. No, I'm not going to arrange a lot more crap than you said. I said to you. I said to you. But no, Glenn, Glenn was, you know, when I worked with him in Tripoli, he was one of the guys that actually got along with very well. Because you get a lot of guys that, over, that do overplan, they're too meticulous and you don't need to be. And he believed in the adage of keep it simple. I'll say stupid, that a lot, especially the ROTC guy that I'm talking about, keep, keep the kids principle. So we would actually, in Tripoli, the guys were doing operations, the guys were going over their, their contingency plans for communication, which you might have three lines of communication, radios, phones, and whatever else, the smoke signals, if that's all we have. You know, we had guys on our team that would make nine or ten, and we would just sit in England, and just sit there and watch the show called Black Guy. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie before. It's a great movie. And we would just make fun of them. So Glenn was like that. Glenn was the type of guy that uses common sense. Was also somebody that was obviously willing to sacrifice himself because he was a man. He was our 18 Delta, one of them. And he was also smart enough to know that when planning was needed to put that aside, it was time to take action. And you know, he what he did, and I'll probably say it again, he actually, with the team there in Tripoli, they commandeered uh, an oil executive's plan. Uh, come here, it's Peter. They chartered a plane. It wasn't a living, it wasn't a U.S. plane. They actually went and chartered a plane to fly to Benghazi that night at midnight. Why that is important and why that's heroic is because if he didn't do that, Oz and Dave Lou, who were here by Morris that night, would not be alive. They would have let out. But I'll get into that in more detail. Anyway, I'm going to take about an hour and 15 minutes of your time. If you have to get up, use the bathroom and go. It's not a problem if you want to get up. And just walk out, that's fine, that's bothering In fact, you'll see me, I kind of lose it a little bit. I go out and I'm not really here, so I'm not, I'll be I'm not really paying attention to what you all are doing. Um, that's not the kind of thing either. That's the thing is. I'm going to touch on what took place through my eyes. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit, because it's hard for me to get 13 hours into an hour. Um, I'm going to try to hit main points. I'm not going to get political. Just, it's not, there's no reason to. Now, there's going to be some names mentioned in here that are politicians, but it's not political, because this is, I'm telling you the truth. I'm not telling you what side I don't really care what side you're so It makes no difference to me. Because when combat comes around and battles start going, it doesn't matter if you're Republican, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, red, green. When bulls start flying, you guys are all on the same team. I believe you guys. <laughs> I know that's true because I've been done. Well, I'll just get started. 
The team uh, with the local spots out there, maybe I'll leave this for myself, Tyrone Woods, Dave Steele, Jack Silva, Dave Steele, uh, D.B. Ben Boone, who's my best friend, still is my best friend, uh, First Green Mom Marine, and then we had Mark Osgeist, Marine Infantry, and John T. Tiger, Marine Infantry, and then there was me, the Army Ranger, the Lone Ranger, and obviously being the Lone Ranger and the TV so good it wasn't, the Rangers were going to handle everything again. I was the glue of that operation. <laughs> 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 but it, we had an outstanding team. We had been there as a team together, and you, you know, you don't just play together, you come in several times because you're contracted, you don't come in as a full team. But that team had been there, at least on the ground, together with everybody, six guys there, for about 45 days, and that's actually a long time for contractors to be in the same spot, all of us at the same time. Um, I do believe that God had us there at the same time as well, because myself, Tyrone Woods, and also, uh, D.B. was supposed to go home to his farm. And when we got word that the ambassador was coming in, we were asked if we'd stay longer. And we said, no, we said, yes, we will. We'll stay longer, we'll sin, and we'll have all the security. Now, that was important because we weren't part of, I got you, Joey's program. He'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> that was important because we were not working for the State Department. We had no responsibility to the State Department. The ambassador was coming in, he was being protected by four security officers here at the State Department compound, and then two guys coming from Turkey, State Department diplomatic security officers. These guys had about 12 years of military experience between them. They had a 90 year compound they were protecting them on constantly. They also had the 17th February March Brigade, which was a militia that was supposed to be the pure record and living there on the consulate. And to put that in perspective, 17th February Mark Brigade sided with Nassau Sharia as soon as we left, which was Nassau Sharia was a terrorist organization that is now formed in ISIS. It gave me kind of clue of uh, how protected the concept was there in the end. So when your family ambassador was coming, and Ambassador Stevens was no low ranking ambassador, there was no deal with Tom, he didn't give money to a campaign to become an ambassador. He didn't work his way up. He raided the people that don't know this. In ambassadorship, I worked at the State Department for two years before with the CIA. As an ambassador, you have different levels of ratings. And he rated vice president status. He was a three star general, if you want to put it in perspective, of high level of So when we found out he was coming in with two security officers into a nine year compound, coming and living on the concept, where there's a, basically a terrorist organization protecting him, living with him on the concept, we said, heck no, we're not waiting for him. So throughout that time, just to give you a backdrop of what the God was like and how dangerous it was, we did not tell you this. The concept had been attacked twice before. They've been by IEDs twice before, two quite explosive devices. 45 days prior to 9-11-2012 and only 30 days prior to 9-11-2012. We had tried to respond to those attacks and we were told to stand down for a while. Luckily for us, there was no follow-up on it, so that took place. Also, the British ambassador, who lived at the council had been hit as well. We need to tell you that. They had been hit by an RPG, an RPG attack in front of the council. Their SUV, armored up SUV, RPGs, rocket blow grenades go through civilian level seven, what we call them armored vehicles, and it had punctured that. And we responded to that attack and found that the British ambassador security officer with a piece of trap lodged in his arm, his arm was hanging off, and we responded to that attack as well. So the indications that they're being attacked are on the council pretty um, And we had attempted to do our best to try to pull that and put an intel on it. Let the State Department and the CIA know, hey, this is a pretty bad place. And that's what his best to try to get people there. I remember because I remember we were working in Tripoli at the time, and the RSO from the regional security officer from being out from Tripoli come in and say, man, I'm frustrated, I can't get what I need, my guys are hanging out to dry, can't get machine guns, can't get new guys. And so we just knew that something bad was going to happen. Well, as the time goes on, we get to 9 11 2012. The teams are doing their operations. We do local file operations. It means we go out with two-man teams. We even make all by ourselves. We know the city's better than locals. We pride ourselves on that. The learning curve is within a week or two. You've got to know the city better than locals. And it's awesome because you get to go out and you get to mingle with all the locals. you got to be to keep your head on the store most of the time. I think it's some of the best coffee shops in the Mediterranean. <laughs> it's awesome, fantastic. <laughs> and honestly, as long as you have a case of Cipro, Cipro Flaxen, it's an antibiotic, 
you can enjoy food. <laughs> 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 you know, they don't really have any health code standards where she just trying to worry if the guys watch And that's the best all that she needs to do. Part of the presentation. Anyway, so we're throughout the time here. You know, Lacey Terry, and they, I'm going to do all the guys doing our operations. Myself and Boone are on keyboard for graduate graduates. So we're on standby, two of us, all day, on standby, monitoring our team going out. Now, what people don't realize is Middle Easterners, and those of y'all that have worked with the Middle Easterner after, realize that things that we take for granted here can cost you your life overseas. A flat tire can cost you a life. Because you get stopped and trying to change a flat tire, bad guys you know where you're at, they're calling their friends. And while you're changing that pack back that flat tire, an IED drops up, blows up, kills you, or they do a drive. So we got two guys on here, myself and Boone, who are on standby making sure that if anybody happens in town, whether it be a flat tire, a car wreck, or an attack, that we can get out and get it out. We're also monitoring all the radio traffic. And we're also watching Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera sometimes gets information quicker than CIS. So all you, all you on the Intel side, remember that, okay? <laughs> remember that and sometimes you got to be able to get in there and blend and get in with the local and get human intelligence, because the news agency, especially the news agency, is getting information quicker than, quicker than we were. Problem. So we're watching Al Jazeera. We're also watching Battleship. You all see Battleship? The Kirk's movie, the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think it's that Bezos movie we had, so I watched it like 80,000 times. So we're watching Battleship, Al Jazeera, we're monitoring radio traffic. We're on a map board, so we're hitting when there's any threats. So let's say there's a protest going on in town, and you know, we're going to have to get out there in this area of Seattle. Let's say there's a mass gathering. <clears throat> we're heading, we're going so we're putting it on the map board. Let's say there's a video of a storm protest to cause a mass gathering. We're gonna know about it. So we're gonna put it on the board and say, guys, this area is hot Seattle. Hey, you know what, Chief? There's a video that's gonna spur these people up and get them, get them going and leave in Seattle City. No, it's not like that one on the yacht, it's quiet. Yeah, there's people shooting their machine guns in the air, that's just how it goes. They don't have any issues with machine guns in the air. They get their coffee on time, they shoot their machine guns in the air. They make a red light, they shoot their machine guns in the air. The red light tracks are working. You get what I'm saying. It's commonplace over there for people to have guns to shoot. But as far as they're being threatened that day, in particular due to some video, or they're bringing protests or mass gatherings in the city that day, there were none. And I've been through those, they're scary as well. You don't get caught in protests or mass gatherings, because they will go to their arms on either side. But it was quiet all day. Now, at 9 o'clock at night, 9 p.m., I hear Ty and John coming back from doing an operation. They're doing a little reconnaissance and working back, they're going to go the next day. And at 9 p.m., I left to help tour. And I hear him come across the radio and call him Dave State Department Hospital. Ty goes, Dave, Dave, we're going to come check on We would do that periodically. Like I said, the console was 90 acres. It was huge. It was a resort. It was not defensive at all. There's a scene in the movie, you know, see 13 hours. And you see Pablo Stryker, who plays me in the movie, he plays Tom in the movie, and by far is the best actor in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you see Pablo on the diving board. He's got the Copenhagen in, he's tearing the cup, he's going, guys, any big element in taxes, you guys are all going to have to die. That wasn't dramatized. I said that out that verbatim. And I remember seeing Scott's eyes. Just, Scott looked at the state farm off and stole my hand. I mean, yeah, it's like, and I, I remember thinking, oh, I just, I think I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember coming back and saying, you know what? Guys, if you ever need us, we can get And we gave it ready. So we would make sure from time to time if we were out, that we would stop and check on. So that's what Ty was doing. He was saying, Dave, I'm going to come out of the concert. Me and Dave, he wants to stop by. Dave comes up across the radio, so I'm in the radio traffic, and he goes, Ty, we're good, and gosh, we're going to be at 1. 9 p.m., 9 11, 2012, Ty and John are driving in front of the concert. It's quiet. And Dave tells them it's quiet for long. They drive in the concert, and I think we're at the annex. We're at the annex. We're three quarters of a mile away from the concert, getting perspective of how close we were. It's a different, whole different facility. They drive into our facility annex. Ty puts his keys in the I say, what's going on? I said, Ty's fired. Everything's good out there. Okay, good. Oz is going out. And Oz is going out on an operation. And one of our jobs as a, as a security officer is sometimes we have to act 
as a boyfriend or husband for a female case officer. So I remember officers going out and I smiled at Alice because I had a lot of you know, so I got to go out with this girl because she's getting out to put this in perspective. I think this is funny. <laughs> all right, she, now, if you ever seen the movie, you see women all over our base at the annex, there was a, there was one. That's her. She was spicy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I never smiled at Oz because Oz drew the short straw and take her out on the date. <laughs> now, again, we haven't seen women in three months. She's the only woman on the base that we're fighting to not go out there. That puts <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude, have fun. <laughs> so we headed out, 915. 932, myself and the boom are sitting back, we're just going to off, get done with this date, and we're going to call and ready. And it's very nonchalant. And I said to the bird, he's from our team leader, he says, we know if you're the team leader. And boom looks at me and goes, first thing is, what did you do? Boom's been with me for 10 years. We started at Blackwater Security, so we all heard that back in 2003. We were class one, the very first class that we had. So we've been working together for that many years, 10 years. He saved my ass two times. Sorry, Dean. He saved me. Uh, and I guess he's gonna rock. He's still one of the best friends. Well, he knows that Tom likes to play jokes on case officers. All these case officers, as it progressed on to later in the years and how it is now, not all of them, but the majority of them are college educated, high level, high, highly educated kids, normally from Harvard or from some of the IRA schools. They all go to the farm. They get their training at the farm, they come to Afghanistan, Iraq, or somewhere, and every one of them is Jason Moore. Every one of them is Jason Moore. <laughs> so I don't like to mess with them. <laughs> you know, they don't know. I've got two, actually, in not two months more, because I'm from a state office. I've got two masters. I don't let them know. They don't even know. I'm just a dumb man. So I like to do stuff. To Mike said, I had it. And here's an example of what I can do. Whenever they screwed up, they don't like to be put down. And you know, SEALs and Marine Rangers, that's how we do That's how we build ourselves up by getting our secures to knock us down a little bit. So I got to do the same thing. And I have this thing on from Chocolate Thunder. And that's why you see in the movie, you see there's a reference to Chocolate Thunder where Pablo and Dave, which is Boone and myself, or dude, this guy's in there, dude, playing the dude, all that. We put that in there because I had a little placard of Robert Downey Jr. and Sergeant Cyrus O'Malley looking like this saying, never go full and we never rest of it. And whenever they did the thing that I thought was dumb, I go and put it on my desk. And of course, they didn't like that, Bob didn't like that, Chief, and we get called in and they didn't like that because it made everybody else miserable and the Rangers feed off misery. So who looks at me and goes, dude, what'd you do? Because he's been feeding off my minimum misery that I've caused for 10 years. <laughs> but I look at him and go, you know, I'm getting in. I'm sitting here all day. You watch the pouch, Chris, do we ever hang? All day, we are hanging out. 30 seconds later, though, you didn't get a call. And it says, we need all Jewish report to the team now. Now, Boone is the antithesis of me. He's very philosophical, very quiet, which is awful for me, really. Um, <laughs> and he's extremely intelligent. He's our sniper. He's our, he is, he's our Zen master. Obviously, as you can tell, I'm not a loud voice. I like to read comics. I like to read but I remember he looked at me and he smiled. And that's his way of saying, when I said out loud, I said, man, we'll give you some fun in that. And we got our gear on, and we get all our stuff, and we're out the door, because all our stuff's ready, and we're always ready. All our stuff's ready next to us, and we decide to have to go which we keep in our team. And um, I got used to fighting in shorts, it's not a dramatization. I was wearing shorts at night, I still hot. I didn't believe, I mean, actually, after so many years as a contractor, and doing and putting in my time, I can pretty much do whatever I want, honestly. So, in the Middle East, it gets hot. And so, shorts is the best way to go, because you stay cool. If you're going to fight, stay cool. You guys play basketball in the pump pants? <laughs> so it's the same town. And this piece of cloth from here to here is not going to save your life in combat, I promise you. <laughs> so, you run out the door, and immediately as we go out the front door, the cost is right around 12 o'clock. And I'm seeing the treasures. Treasures are heated around. Every third round is heated, so at night you can change, you can adjust your fire. Luckily for us, the terrorists have not, or most of our enemies have not grasped the concept of night vision. So they still have to use treasures. And that's awesome. And it's good for us. But you're seeing the treasures, George. It's, it's awesome. 
<laughs> they want me to get it at them one time. One time in your life, watch a fire. In fact, I used to go, when I used to fly to Boston Guard, which is outside of Canada, our home province, or when I used to go to Sepah, which is south of Tripoli in Libya, um, you know, we would fly in secretly. And we'd go to these areas, and I'd go up on the rooftops, and I'd grab a cup of coffee, and I'd walk some uh, terrace and delicious fine chip. I mean, it, honestly, it's a lot better than you know, the reality. You learn to get ashes and all that reality. <laughs> but that's how. It's just, it's cool. It's just, see the burner, and you're seeing here the explosions because an RPG does not whoosh as much as the movies like to say it. You hear it when it takes, but you hear an explosion also from the propeller from an RPG, and then you hear an explosion when it hits. Luckily for us, a lot of times the terrorists would have to take a little plastic tube off the nipple because it's protected. So you'll see it sometimes go boom and it'll fall down and you have to take a safety down. Which is good for us. Anyway, the reason is boom. And you see the church go in the team. This is where I have respect for all the services. Because even though we were from Navy, Army, Marine Corps, Air Force Story, I don't know where you're at. Anyway, the team, nothing needs to be said. My speech is to corporations about leadership. I said sometimes leadership means not saying anything at all. Relying on your team to do right. Everybody has a job, and everybody's doing it. None of us are barking at each other. We're all well over in our 40s, except for taking 39. All of us have been NCOs or officers or both in the military, and the team and everybody's doing a job. It's like a symphony. It's, it's awesome. And within five minutes, we're ready to go. And I remember seeing Ty. Ty looks at me, and I'll be in. He's driving the sedan. He's got a tape jacket and sedan. I'm driving the SUV with me and boom. And I got my gear on. I got my machine gun. I got my rifle. I got all my stuff in my pockets are full, and my cargo pockets are full, magazines, armors, all my items, tons of stuff. And I can go through this and it's ready to go. I go this back and I walk up, our chief of base while I'm standing here, our team leader, who's a staffer, who's known about the first year, who's in charge of us. Chief's there, team leader's there, I go up and go, we're ready to go. It's 9 37. I'm going to go out and watch. 9 37. Right, we're ready to go. Chief looks at our team leader. Team looks at me, and Chief goes to the team and goes, you tell these guys to meet Chief the team looks at me and says, you guys need to come out of here. I walk back, I get on the rest of the tie, and he tells us we got away. Now, I'll be honest, I testified to this to Mike Rogers' committee, which was a complete joke, and I've also testified to this to the Regatta Select Committee, which actually, there's been some, some, some headway there, and I think both sides of the Democrats and the Republicans actually a lot, especially down on the Democrat side, and also to the guy on the Republican side, are doing some good things. But I just said, I said, you know, I'll give you this first five minutes, because I'm probably doing the same thing. I'm a leader, I'm trying to get information to make the best plan possible. Granted, it's a civilian trying to make a military decision when the fighting drug started, but he's my leader, I've been trained to listen to my leadership, military program, Roger that, maybe he knows something we did. Also, because we had such a dissension in that base, it really was the staffers, the CI staffers, and then it was the contractors. It wasn't a full team element there. But we really didn't know what we were doing there. We didn't know where we were getting all the, we didn't feel like we were getting all the information. So I'm figuring maybe he does know that there's a military, maybe there is a military that he's not telling us it's in Maybe there's a militia here that he's telling us it's friendly to us. That, I'm sorry, that he didn't tell us that it's in country that he didn't also want to. Granted, he wasn't, he was, he was locking up. He was out of his element. That's okay. So the way he is out of it's when, as a leader, you gotta step back and say, you know what? I'm not such a matter of extra leader. These guys are our supporters. Take charge of this. This is what should have done initially. But he didn't. I said it's 20 Well, five minutes turns to 10 minutes. And we heard a crack on the radio. And I remember we gave Alec and, and Scott and Dave radio so they could call us. And it just starts coming. It's like, guys, do you have a you need? Jiris, we've been over the line, we need you here now. Jiris, what the hell are you doing? Where are you guys at? And you're just kind of sitting there. You guys ever play college sports or ever play college football? Think of it as your teammate. That he's, you're seeing him, and he's getting tore up, beat the hell up, and you can't help him. And you're just sitting around your hands. Take us, he didn't get out of his stand. He's upset. Now, I can't hear what he's saying, because I'm in my own vehicle, but I, he goes up to the bottom and he goes like this to the bottom. And I remember, 
asked him to take a look. Because if he gets in the car, I should take a look and say, he says, he's telling me you can't do it, you've got to stand out. Later, Tate said, when I asked him in Germany, he said, what did you Did you say to Bob? I said, hey, I told him we were losing the initiative, which we were. And Bob looked at him and said, you got to stand out. We're told to stand out. I know what Bob wrote in her life to say that we weren't told to stand down because in the back she might be able to go down. You might think that it's a good thing. There's always the media, I always know everything. And uh, you also knew that there was Jimmy Hoffman in his grave too. <laughs> and, uh, we were told to stand down. I'm not going to say it was the fairest, I'm not going to say, I, I don't know what it was more than just Bob did not know what to do because he was scared. That's okay. That's not a problem. Again, you just, as a leader, you've got to turn around and raise what you guys are to do. Now, I wish we would have thought the orders in on us, but we did. We waited 10 more minutes. 25 minutes past this initial call. And I remember hearing Al Henderson come across the radio, and it's verbatim the movie. I made sure of that. With the, the screenwriter, Jeff Hogan, we actually revolved in writing the script. I made sure that the words were made, and every time I hear it in the movie, it was a little brief, it kind of haunts me a little bit. I remember Al coming across the radio going, Jairus, if you don't get here, we're all going to effing die. And that's when I see Ty crack his door open, because we're on vehicles, you can't hold the windows down, all those stuff. You might be able to now do it then. He cracks his door and he goes like this. And Navy Seal Ty, because you want to get these Navy Seals here, they're all big dudes. Navy Seals are going to go to Hollywood after, they're all freaking big dudes. I was I was I was yoked. <laughs> and I seen that hammer hawk come out of his car door. That is oh that's awesome that big arm. Now his arm's about as big as my thigh. That's not saying much because I'm skinny. But <laughs> seeing that go and seeing seeing me was seeing seal six seal team six tie go like this is a big arm. Yeah, let's do this. I gave him a thumbs up back. And we started heading out the gate. Now Again, when I do speeches to the corporations, or speeches about leadership, I talk about in crisis situations when things change minute by minute, your plan has to change, or your job, or whatever you're going to do has to change. So, throughout the 25 minutes, every one of us, and this is a credit to the military, how we're training the special technology community, every minute that goes by, whether you're sending us out in the background, or you're actually in the park, or you're actually moving to an operation, you're more game because the situation's changing. So, as a leader, the situation's changed from the beginning to that 25 minutes, and I feel like I've lost my car keys. God, I'm not convinced. Well, then I hit him. Interpreter, we get our limbs. Now, this is why I think I was with us as well. We stopped the car. We had one interpreter on the base. He couldn't be anywhere on the base. He's not answering his radio. And I get out the car, I go and find him. And some of the characters are finding him. He's walking right in front of me. And I go in there and say, we need you, bro. No, Henry. Henry's a linguist, he's not a combat term. There's a difference. <laughs> and from here you can tell, here you can tell. He's not supposed to go out the, out the base. He sits there and he translates documents or talks to people on the phone. He's not what he's called for. And to give you an idea of what he looks like because he's not prepared to go out and do combat ops. Think of Bob Newhart if he was a region. <laughs> I said, Baldi, he's about front beat. He was adorable. He's a cute thing, Arizona. Why go out to enter and say, dude, we need you? He goes, Tom, I'm going to open this call for you. Exactly what I'm doing. Exactly. I pulled my pistol, I gave it to him, I said, you're not going to get your stuff. And he turned to me, my pistol, and turned to me, and he ran into the building seat. Now, I'll be honest, when I when he first did that, he ran off and thinking, <laughs> but he came back in 30 seconds and he's not a weapons guy. He doesn't have his own armor even. Not his own helmet. So he's got something else going on. It is on backwards. <laughs> his armor actually looks better than the movie when he, in real life it was too big. So, he like a so when he's coming out, he looks like a turtle. <laughs> and he's going to be Thomas and he looks like a cute turtle. <laughs> It, you know, I was more motivated than anything then because this guy, not trained for this, he's not supposed to go out. I got all the gates and warrants running on the base for head to They're freaking out. This guy kept it together. When it got to the rear, you know, it was all backwards and it was fitting, right? You got to fix. 
And he said, I'm coming with you. Well, this is a dedicated thing. And we were off the gate. Now, I'll skip around a little bit because, like I said, I've got to condense 13 hours into this. We drive there. We go through the back, the back, the back alley, which right? we need to get in there. We go on the road uh, called gunfire. And as we're getting there close, we start seeing a militia. And we don't know who they are. We don't know if they're friendly to us at all. And they're, they're not doing anything. It looks like cats running around with you know, people throwing firecrackers at them. They're just running around jumping. There's one guy that has a bottle of lava, a ski mask. He's carrying a PKM, which is a, uh, it's an Easter Block M60. It's a belt fed machine. And he's going around the corner of the road that we need to make a right to go to the front of the consulate, which is 400 meters away still. And he's turning to the road and he comes back. He turns around the corner and he's shooting. He's the only one that's far back. So we're thinking, well, they must be taking fire. And so we park, stop. I go to him and I see to figure this out. And I never command what's going on. He goes to our team here, they go out and do their thing. We hop out of the car. As soon as we hop out of the car, we start going to that turn that we're supposed to drive our car down. And we didn't tell you this. We started hearing snaps, snap, 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 snap. And what that is, is we don't know what that is. It's, have you ever heard of a little crap? Snap, snap, snap. It's when a high velocity round goes by your head, it breaks a sound. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you did that to me once too. That's how you're talking about this number two. Right? If you've got three days to go to school here, one of them I'm sure will be one issue that you <laughs> Shots. And about the Air Force put the seals off. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyway, those snaps are going. Now what that also tells us is that I know Jeremy Skate Hillers is he's a decent piece of crap in Virginia and the Washington Post likes to call us contractors mercenaries. I get called Social media, of course, they're going to call my faces, but on social media, I've been called a killer, murderer, rapist, because I'm a contractor, I'm a mercenary. I've never shot anybody as a contractor in the HMV first. Never. I'm very lucky that they all missed. <laughs> so, what I'm trying to tell you is when you hear those snaps, we know we can shot at, and we know, okay, we can turn this love from safe to semi and just to fight back. And again, the team's awesome. Nobody needs to say a word, nobody panics. Everybody gets their weapons. I see Tig has a 140 millimeter grenade launcher. Tig already has it. Aaron cracked the breach, put a golden egg in there, 41 grenade. Aaron run the horn, boom. Count to two, three, boom. And it, as long as that sound's going out, it's an awesome sound. It's trying to hang out so much. <laughs> he starts talking about He's throwing rounds down, which is heavy machine guns and small arms with a block of our tribe down. Boom, the you know, boom or sniper. He moves it, let's get high time. That. So I grab all my gear, grab a machine or rifle. I find two local militia guys that I don't know why I felt like I could trust them, I just felt like I could. And one of them I said, Do you guys speak English? They said, Yes, yes, yes. They always say, Mr. Yes, yes, yes. So I was like, Come with us. Boom, let's see. What are you doing? What are you doing? Force of fire to me, man. Let's go. And we start jumping walls. And when I got up the time, I said, We're going to start working our way to these buildings that are occupied and trying to get you to strike a fire and just get you to find out in my mind. And we start jumping walls. I remember getting the first eight foot wall, which is eight foot concrete wall, and getting the top of it as a 42 year old ranger that doesn't work out as much as I used to, with all this gear. And going, Holy crap, this is going to be hard. I'm not going to shake it. And very hard. And you know what? And this is why I believe that the military still needs to scar people up. I know we've heard it as, oh, you can't be nice, you've got to be political, you can't ever pay for a basic, you're just trust dollars. No. I was, my first day basically, the kid from New York smart off to the drill sergeant, and the drill sergeant came on the desk and dead. And that was me going out to the signals. And as a ranger private, that's the worst, that is the worst year of my life. Not good. It is necessary because all those pains and those terrible times that I felt going through the river, you know, going to ranger school, being a private ranger town is worse than any of the end of the ranger school. It's awful. Because you have to go to work every day. You don't want to be there because you're going to get messed with and it's going to hurt. But all that training and all that pain that you go through and all that, we call them FF games, which you guys can do in the They're the mind games that, they, that the senior guys play with. When you get to the combat situations, it makes it 
all clear. It makes it simple. You're not working. You're not scared. We can deal with it. And that's what it was. That pain was the wrong. Yeah, that was smart. I've done this before. I can do this. And also the thing about cars picking you know, and sure can't sure to get over the wall. Right? There's an actual get over the wall. And we did. And we moved out to the top of the building that was not occupied. We get to the fourth floor and we look in and there's too many trees and too much smoke and we can't see in and I'm like this. I'm like, bust that bug. And I get on the road and I said, Ty, I was Tom, what you see? I said, Ty, this is the boss, you can't see anything. I said, just shoot me, we communicate with each other. And we did. And the media didn't tell you this. That 400 meters that we fought our way on, we found out that's how sure they're not going to get on the road, which is to take over the compound. It took us another 30 minutes. So by the time we actually got on the compound, it had been over an hour since we got called that they were going to attack. And by that time, Sean is going to be we didn't know. By that time, Sean is going to be bashful over there. Because we get on the compound, and it's completely on fire. I mean, it's, it's one of the most beautiful sights. When you're in combat, and you're not allowing yourself to be in combat, be immersed in it, or any crisis situation, I and mean, you don't worry about what's going on, it's beautiful. Um, you know, I, I just I don't like it political, but this really bothers me because of the family members. Whenever I hear her report say father over, she said it the most. Uh, any politician says that they bother her the most, they hear the most, and she says she wants to be the most. It bothers me because there's no such thing. There's no such thing as a father over. When you're a comment, everything is so beautiful and big. That orange is the most orange you've ever seen in a fire. That green grass, I feel like a basket series. That's what I told Michael Lewis, you've got to make that green look like it's a awful green. The blue pool, the blue waterfalls, it's just beautiful. Because you're allowing yourself to be there. There's no such thing as a fog. So if there's any politicians in here, don't say this anymore. Run on the stage, you'll Scott coming to the tap on her. Don't say that, there's no such thing. Fog wars is what politicians say. You know, people that are in combat, they have fossils. If you've been in it, there's no such thing. When we get in there and we link up, and we start moving, Ty and Jack, awesome, already started going that bill that's off fire. They're already running in there trying to find some fire. So the rest of us are going out and spinning and going out to these different buildings. Because there's four buildings on an anchor compound all spread out. And long story short, the book goes on and all the great things on the back day too, because I've spent a lot of time. The bottom line is we find all the survivors, and we start putting them back. We make our, our collection point at the burning yellow, and we start moving everybody over there. And that's when I come around the corner, and I hear the boom come up to me and goes, man, we lost it. We lost it. Because we lost our team and kind of thing. Our team here. Who's there? She was Sean. We lost Sean Smith. And I'm thinking, man, he just got her two days ago. That sucks. <clears throat> now, people are like, well, that's insensitive. Well, I'm not going to be wrong with it. You can't tell me that doesn't hurt. We got a long night ahead of us. Yeah, it sucks to die. I remember running to the front of the building, and I got a child. Past it, child's mom is my mom. But they didn't even figure out. I'm not going to work with death. But I go over and I see Sean, I see Jack, and I see Dave Boot, and the state farm officer found a gas mask, pulling Sean's body out of him. And I see Scott Wilkin, who was with the ambassador, who, who lost contact with the ambassador in the villa, sitting there, going into shop. He's covered in smoke. He looked like he knew got his jammies on, he's got his shorts on, a t shirt, he doesn't have any shoes. And I remember seeing Jack look at Scott, and see Scott start to go into shop. He can tell by just the people in the eyes. And Jack, maybe still, trained Christ, he looks at me and goes, I know what he's thinking. Sean's dead, obviously. And he goes to Sean and he tries to assess what he's doing is he's showing Scott that we're still in the spot that we're not going to give up. Even though Sean's dead. And it works. Scott comes back out. And Jack goes up to him and goes, David, you're lost. Get your head in. Get your head back in the game. We're still in the spot. And we get Scott. We get Sean's body. We put Sean's body in the back of the SUV that our team leaders were up after we were in the compound. He didn't want to start the prayer that back to him. You know, not there. I don't know what I was saying. Anyway, we put Sean's body in the back of the SUV. I remember I skipped her over. We get the rest of the guys, Scott and Alan and Dave, into their black group. Scott wants to drive. And then Jack comes up to me and says, hey, they didn't get into the classified information, they got to go back to the top and get it. And so myself and Jack run back to the top, the tackle operators that are going to start cutting wires and start grabbing computers and everything. And this, there's comedy and comment. I know, I, I know Marcus very well, I like him. I know Teddy very well, Chris Cowboy. 
most popular in sniper great movies. What they miss though is there's a lot of comedy in combat. That's why you see the one liners in our movie, they're not dramatized. We say all that. It's funny. So as I'm playing back, myself to Jack, we go to the top, we cut bars, we grab all the electronic media that we can find, all the computers, all the hard drives, running back. I'm next to him. I have to computers. <laughs> I got to run back, Jack looks at me and goes, man, I'm going to get you shot the best time. Let's just say you just, it's how we deal with stress. And it was fun. And I wanted to say something back, but I couldn't because it was, it was, I almost felt off. Well, it was so fun. But so when we get to the line first, we do all the classroom information here. Jack and Ty go up to Scott, who really shouldn't be driving, but he wants to drive out there. And they tell Scott, when you leave this compound, make sure you go left and not right. So that's how sure he has a safe house 200 meters from the constant. If he doesn't tell you that, Adam Housley, I think, reported on that once. He's a correspondent with the Fox for a long time. Answer three has a safe house 200 meters from the constant was built next to the terrorist safe. So, that's why we tell Scott, when you go out, make sure you go left and not right. When we say that, there's a big explosion in the back side of the bill, I see a guy running by me. Now, about this time, there's people all over the constant. There's Libyans everywhere. Middle East people, when you fight the Middle Eastern or Africa, people don't go with firefights and come around the edge and look. It's like us in the grass trying to go on now, and when the tornado sirens go on, we don't go hide in the basements, we go look to see where the tornado is. <laughs> it's the same thing with firefights in these countries. They don't go hide, they can't even want to find out what's going on. So, there's Libyans all over this constantly now. We don't know who's friend, who's foe. It's, it's, it's pretty difficult to discern anything. So when I see a guy running by me after the explosion with his hands, and I yell, I live in my turn off, he speaks English, but I run out. He goes, grenade. So I figure, well, this guy tried to put a grenade off. He pulled the grenade off for two, he held it for two seconds, and he held it for three seconds, instead of holding it for two, through it, with his hand. So I'm going to say, so it's mine. And he goes, you're on, you're on, you're on. There's a second explosion that hits the building. This one knocks me down. And I know what that is, it's an RPG. And I look around the corner of the villa, and the commander, if you see the movie, there's a part of the movie with Apollo Schreiber, who is his new army, and playing the clock with the commander, and this commander has a bad ass phone number. That was true. And I remember saying to the commander, well, when you bring your guys to your closest back gate, and he did, he let it go, which allowed them to count assaults, counter attacks. And as soon as that second uh, RPG hit, the water faucet turned on, just snaps, 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 whatever. And I remember the only thing I had to take cover was this vehicle, it was flat through the one engine block, and I take cover and I start shooting back as fast as I can. And my vision's on, lasers are just popping, anything that's trying to go through that wall, I see it above the flash. And there's somebody calling the horn, huh? Who's talking? I'm hearing me. And I'm still firing, putting that cover behind the sniper. And there's somebody real loud, and I look. Well, I took cover behind the sticky cross vehicle. They want to leave. <laughs> 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 so I come out, so I come out, and I say, come on. <laughs> I go this way, and I go out, take a knee, and I'm out the open, and I start firing again. And I put my eyes in the way, and I see the way. And I remember going, you are <laughs> Now, I don't go to America, they went through a lot. They made a mistake. They got tore up. Watch the movie, you can see how bad they got it. I remember, now I remember I'm getting back to Annex. And that thing was still on fire in our axe. The running flat was still burning in the other ball. But anyway, I remember taking it in, and I'm out the open just like this, I'm just shooting back as fast as I can. And there's snaps going around and I'm flying. Every guy's got me, I know I do. You know, and I've been in situations where God shit felt like he was there. And I've been in situations where I felt like he was there. And that was one. You feel warm, you feel protected, there's no clear much. Ain't nothing gonna hit you. I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting. My right ear comes blows out, and it hurts. Look, and there's this Libya. Come out of the middle, it looks like he just got to work from back in America. He has slacks on, nice shoes. I see him here with you. Look at that pair just taking his jacket off. I'm taking the knee right next to me. He's got a nice AK, and he looks at me, smiles, and keeps shooting. That's awesome. So I look at him and go, God sent me a little Libya angel. 
Miss Lord Bay, he shoot next to me, we're shooting. And my team leader, who mentioned one star for the river that night, was calling me on the radio going, Tom, I'll take cover. And my head, I'm going to get your chicken butt out and help me. And as I think that, boom, I see him screaming around the middle. And it's awesome. He's coming to me. I see him on the corner of my eye. He knows I'm not an ammunition. He always has a magazine in his right hand. I see it. Draw a magazine, he slides across the road, I put it in. He takes me on the other side of me. And now we're in three of us. Man, I'm just going at Now, like I said, I like to make fun of Marines a bit. <clears throat> So all these small points are so pretty for me. Marines are tough as nails. They are. They are some of the bravest people I've ever been around. And they will put their heads to the brick wall and tell them, I really can't. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I get to the next step, though. Sometimes I think it was the racing ass that's not always firing them. Huh? <laughs> as I'm shooting, I see a little flash on top of the villa. The villa that's on fire. Burning on that fire. And it's Tate. Tate climbed up on the villa to get a better vantage point. Just don't shoot now. And it's incredible. That's self service, a sacrifice. He doesn't care about his state. He wants to make sure everybody else is okay. That's how we should always be. Sacrifice yourself for others. That's what he's willing to do. And that motivated me to be badass. This is so bad. This is badass. Well, it's bang, girl, shoot. And eventually an RPG gun comes around the corner of that lower black back gate many times. And we see all the lasers and whoosh. And the other one falls back. RPG, two, falls back. And it's, it's the strangest thing. It's just sometimes it's combat's work. Sometimes you hit a guy and it'll intensify the fighting. And sometimes you hit the right guy and it'll stop. And that's what happened. He went down, two fell, water faucet turned off, all the snaps stopped. Roger that. We get the work that we do an ISR or drone now. We get word that there are 40 people asking for a counter so we need back to the annex. The only problem was we had a family bathroom. This is hard for me to deal with to this day. Ranger Curry to fit stance is part of it that's generally falling on my phone hands and in. We didn't know he was there. Granted, we know we looked. It was hard to get something out of that bill. Very, very hard. But we loved him. He wasn't there. He was found at 1 o'clock in the morning by the locals they lived in. It's an obstacle that's the first thing that I'll deal with for the rest of my life, but I can't. I'm trying to do it. When we get back to the end, it's midnight. We get word that Glenn Dory and his team are trying to get to us from Tripoli. We get word that Glenn and his team is, I mean, this is awesome. We have no U.S. assets. No U.S. air support is anywhere in the country. So Glenn is trying to get a charter plane. He's trying to try a charter of all executives plane, a private plane, to get to us. Bring his team to Delta Force Hawk. <coughs> well, we got up on the annex, we got up on our roofs, you know, our fighting positions, and we know that we're going to get attacked. You know? Now, long story short, I see people massive on the east side of the compound, and they're moving towards us, they're moving, they're moving. And I keep getting word on the radar, people calling our chief saying, we're expecting any friends, we're expecting any friends. I keep getting word from the chief, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think so. Now, here's the problem with overseeing your fighting machines. Not only do you have to worry about bad guys shooting you, this is what people are up against overseas. And this is what the RTC guys do. You, know. you also have to worry about if you shoot a guy that you think is an enemy, and maybe the local governor's place says he's not, you are going to jail. So ties on the radio going, don't shoot the wrong guy. You gotta make sure that they're not they're not friends or we're gonna go to jail. It's tough. <laughs> I remember DB Boom says, I see an AK. When he says he sees an AK, you see a physical defense. It explodes, and the fight just opens in the pan area. What they threw was a gelatina bomb, which is what they used for fishing. They dropped it in, it's no tracker man, just a big flash man. They used it for fishing, it's Mediterranean, but it's fishing basically. <laughs> <laughs> now, both of the greater details of the movie is an outstanding job showing the nine firefights. Almost, I mean, they put the lasers, iron lasers, and bullets, and everything fine. And there was about 10 guys, and I'll just keep it short, to fight them off. It's a beautiful thing seeing the terrorists go down, and that's what God, it takes us maybe 10 minutes. We have a break, two, between one and three, where we don't get attacked. <clears throat> we hear that Glenn's team is actually, by one o'clock, is actually at a new airfield. They're having a problem. They can't get to us. Because we don't have a blister, we don't have a mess for them. So they're trying to find a way to get to us. 
We also have some moments of reflection. One of mine is from a prayer Bible that I have. And it says, Bath it is. If I pass out for the day, I make back peace. Now, what that means, and I said, I think it means, and what God's telling me is that if I'm in a position where I wasn't in God, that's what I'm supposed to be. And if I die on this battlefield, then that's what's supposed to happen. It's not meaning that you have to give up. What I tell people, especially in groups like this or any other groups to talk about leadership, is sometimes you get a little control. You can't control everything. You gotta let God control the situation. Doesn't mean you put fire and you put work in our streets to get let go. And when I started doing that, I was able to fight that. So when three o'clock comes around, we start getting people mass amounts again. Control's gone. I let God say, hey, these people are supposed to be tackling us. And we start getting people way after the way. People come and ask. And as a long story short, we got to feel the fire, and we just said, come on. It's like, kind of like black woman. We're shooting very off back in the middle. She's like, no, it's not insensitive. These guys are trying to attack us. We got to throw some people that we're trying to protect, but we did say that. He didn't tell you that either. He didn't tell you much. 36. And we're taking out terrorists that are trying to get over our gates. Well, we do that. A couple more hours go by. The legend of us went, finally they did the family ship on Living Shield of Hell's Mask for a minute. And if you've seen the movie, there's a portion of it where you see Paul the Shriver go on with his air laser. He's going to lay out last on the target. Because the legend of us said, you can't find him in front of Gaius, but I'll last on the target. And I'm last on our aid. And Pablo says, guys, I don't know if this is the best time to tell you this, but I have to take a crap for the last five hours. Rolling <laughs> <laughs> conversation. I have to take a crap for five hours. That's the cost. That's the best cost. If you think being in firefighters are hard, try being in firefighters, how do you take a crap? Watch. I'm going to pull the turtle in the book now. I'm going to pull the turtle in well, I remember Glenn T gets in, and Glenn is the only one that goes up to the roof to help stop in our position. Every other old guy, including the Delta guys, go to go to see. The reason I remember that is because I was pissed because I needed somebody to come and leave me up on my body because they just ran crazy. Glenn goes up to Bill C with Ty, he goes up to Jack, uh, Ty, Oz, and Dave Who Who the other says, go use it. That's why shorts is important in combat. I think we're trying to travel about 30 seconds to get to my fire position. I get in my fire position and I hear shh. And my hearing is gone. Boone actually has shot this ear out. This ear shot out when I was at the meeting in Jewel. And I remember thinking, it sounded like somebody stepped on a bag of cheese. And I don't know what it sounded like, but my hearing is gone. And I remember <coughs> thinking, what was that? What was that? Did you guys hear that? And for some reason, it clicked in my head, it was the worst. And I get it right, but the worst. And it says, hey, the third mortar hits the back side of the LC. And I see Ty open up. He's got a machine and he just holds it down. We're still early morning nautical twilights. We're still got our nods off. And it's beautiful. And when you're seeing that laser, it goes safely on the machine. It looks like a laser. It's just... And I see Glenn start shooting. And I see Oz start shooting. I see Dave start shooting. They were trying to counterattack us from the different area. And I turn around, and they're at my 12 o'clock, 40 meter land. That's about 30 meters away from where their buildings at. Probably right back in the middle of the stairs. And I can't see the bad guys, but I'm saying, I'm going to shoot over their heads to keep the snaps going. And then I turn back around, make sure nobody's attacking us from my six o'clock. I come back and I see another one. Boom. Not to go out, come back. The guy falls down since I'm hit. That was big. They got a big shrapnel in his face. They're still talking, he's still breathing. So they treat yourself. Glenn, Ty, and Oz are still fighting. I put a few more rounds down, look around, come back, and see boom, boom, boom. My night vision goes up and it starts to come back while I see his face. And what that is, is when the more the rockets hit, it charges the debris. So the heat's in the charge, it looks like fairy dust. And I see no way to go. And I remember thinking, man, I'm all dead. And it's hard when it's in there. Because when your head's up, you're wrong. You want, you don't want to quit. You start to blow on it. I remember God kicking me in the back of the head and get your gun. I'm going to come back up and make sure to put my down to the top of the building. And then I see a guy get up on the roof and he starts trying to shoot. And every time he tries to shoot, his rifle falls. 
It was Oz. Oz had got a piece of trout and shredded off his arms with arms hanging by a tendon. He doesn't know it. This is how tough Oz never quit, never give up, ever. He gets up, he tries to get the rifle up. Every time he tries to get it up, he has no support system. So he, he didn't know. He's in shock. All he's thinking about the guy that can't go back in the water. And I see Tig climb up on the roof, and I see Tig shirts his shit off down. And as he sits off down, Tig is at the bravery himself. He doesn't look great anymore. He gets up on the roof, sacrificing himself again. Tig is the best at all this time. the greatest at all he gets his arm, he sits Oz down, and Oz is in shock, and all he does, and this is what Tick told me when we were, we were in Germany the next day, is he said, Oz just kept playing with his arm. Oz just kept going, look at this, look at this. <laughs> and Tick was getting frustrated. Tick was getting very frustrated. He's like, dude, stop playing his arm, it hurts, you're making it worse. Tick gets a tourniquet out, puts it on, Oz keeps playing with his arm. <laughs> I have to say this, I have to give him a stop because I told him to get a friend that he could lie. That's not a joke for me. I have to say that. This is like a crazy humor. I'm going to say that. Well, take it off when he gets over to Dave. Dave Hoover was actually worse. Dave's leg was sheared off with a hanging by a tin, and it looked like his leg was actually off because it was covered by his tan. He was armed and sheared off. He tended again. I take his turn on day as well, save your lives. Ty and Glenn were released him. We died far from him. Yes. Yes, I'm a loser. It's a good friend. But I remember, and this is very ironic, we lost him. How did you guys get the more team to stop? But when we shoot a militia, we're escorted to sin. The commander got caught in those seats. When you're on order, he's on the radio. I'm in the building. So you gotta tell. I'm in the building. To take those guys out. And I can hear a firefly where the militia, where the mortar come from. And the living shield saved us. It's ironic that the American militia, we could have been fighting the every day, saved our lives. They saved us. Yeah, we saved the people from the last Well, the night goes on. We get word that. When the militia's coming from my team leader, and my team leader says, Tom, there's only three guns left. For some reason, there's still nobody coming back on the first and second conversation. And me, Jack, and Bill, and that's it. Well, we're on the roof, so my team leader says, there's a technical's coming, about 50 of them. Now it's about 30 that actually show up. The technical is basically a Toyota Tacoma. It's a high pitch, but it's a Tacoma with a machine gun in the back, and basically a bunch of holes to the top. See, sometimes any aircraft does too. And my team leader goes, Tom, make sure they're friends. And I said, Roger, that way. I don't know. Did you have markings on them? I don't know. Do I have any communication with them? I call on the phone. I don't know. No, I don't think so. What uniform do they wear? I don't know. I guess I'm very calm. Thank you. <laughs> he says, well, just make sure they don't get close to the gate. I said, I have a rifle. They have a dish kiss. I said, how am I supposed to stop? I didn't get a word on that. If I see him come, and it's a meeting with our people, it's bad. And I got a parapet, and I get as low as I can behind his parapet, through my concrete wall. And, and I was really like, this is what I was thinking. I was thinking of the movie Ferris Bueller. <laughs> you know, put him on the curl of the butt, and he come and he come back and I swear to come back and call him first. And I'm thinking to myself, I'll just get one guy. Right outside, I put it on the front, the front vehicle, the lead vehicle, the lead guy in the passenger seat. And I think I got it, I got to save him. I'll do the jumbo. And I learned the jumbo from the Sudanese and the Kings. They all go to the meet the labor of these really stretches in North Africa. Actually, Sudanese taught me when I was working in Mosul. It's basically tangles with the Middle East. And I got it. Every time I would go into an area that I wanted to see somebody I was from, I'd do the jumbo. So I reach it. Oh, that's good. And like I said, there's no fog over combat. The guy in the lead vehicle, he's chewing cop. Cops basically cocaine mixed with cocaine and steroids. <laughs> and he goes out of the window and he smiles and goes like this. And it's the most beautiful yellowish brown. <laughs> <laughs> and I just start laughing because Now the movie, the one part that was dramatized, it shows Paulo crying again. <laughs> 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 well, last 
asking him to come on the hospital and give me five more minutes every time during this doctor. And I want to tell you this because the family members were told that the bodies were handled with care. Tiny one's bodies were handled with care. I'm telling you this because the family was told out there. We told the families almost 13 months after what actually happened. For some reason, the Delta guys got out there. And even though we had compounds around, we were protected. We had to get hit for about three or five We got close to two hours. They dropped tiny one's bodies off. That's hard to hear from the bodies of snap. I'm telling this because I want people to know the truth. And I also want people to know that it's always better to take the hard way of these you off. It was so hard for us to tell the animals it's not true. They were dropped. And I've been told what happened to their bodies. I'm not going to tell you here because it's the same place, but it wasn't. It's not the way. Well, we picked their bodies up. We put them on a flat bed. We didn't have body bags. We put sheets over. I remember I set up a purple tie. John set up a purple glove and tie. We drove to the airport. We get to the airport. The charter plane is there. We get all the non-shooters on there. We get all the safety parking people on there. Oz, tough Oz, seen too many John Wayne movies. He said this because we're going to try to help him get on the plane. He said he needed to go out to this country and walk out. And he did. He got out. He was just, and he would not let us out. He just served. <laughs> the flight attendants who actually, they were flight attendants on this charter plane, uniforms and everything. They see him, their eyes come about here, they were in the plane. So I'm thinking, we're going to get the pilot, we're going to get somebody to lost. And we get out of stacks of towels and we start throwing it down to the office and we go over the plane. I was <laughs> pretty stinky and dirty. But he gets on the plane, we get Dave moving on there, Dave's bleeding out fast, still bleeding out. He starts to go in shock. All right, he starts doing convulsions. Sorry, because it's turning to come loose on his leg. We find him tiny enough because he's losing his tongue blood. As he pulls the door, we hear a pop on the plane. The wind grabs him and just shot himself on the We open the door. Our heating and air guy, who obviously didn't get his weapons training from us, anybody here at Prescott, he drops his magazine. And instead of sliding the gun to the river, sliding, putting the slide to the river to take it around the chamber, he decided to clear it by pulling the trigger. <laughs> I'm going to look at the candy cameras for me. Probably won't leave. It's bleeding out. It's bleeding out. God knows. We find that line around it. Lodged in the frame of the chair between his legs. We grab it, pull it out. Plane takes off. We wait. 8.30 comes. The ambassador brought the box. The ambassador brought the box to me. I expect. Just so you guys know, he was not desecrated. I looked at it from head to toe. Make sure. First of all, make sure there's no IEDs in his body bag. But also to make sure he wasn't necessary. 9.30 comes, no plan. 10.30 comes, the transport comes, and I'm thinking, finally, an uh, uh, American C-130 coming to this. Better leave the air, air force. <laughs> 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 mm-hmm. I look at the tailbone, it's a living fly. I remember one of them. It's still an American. The taxis, it goes out of the box. It goes about a half a mile down, makes you right, turns the signals off. I look at my team leader, the country team leader, What's going on here? He said, I don't know. They get in the car with our turret that we had at the airport. They drive down there. I see him talking to the people that the pilot. The pilot goes just to his crew. They get back on the plane. They turn it on. The team leader goes, we got a ride. Right. We get down there. We get on the plane. We fly back to the turret. The plane wasn't for us. Showed up. I know we didn't like to admit to that. But, again, God is looking out. Well, we get back to Tripoli, two hours to take a shower, fly back to the Germany of the State Department of Ireland. First American airplane I saw was flown by a guy named Aristotle, C-17. We get to Germany, still for eight hours, return to TV, and I see something about a video of protest, and now I got him turn off. Well, that's basically it. If I can get anything out of people today, it would be speaking. Again, yes, there are some political ramifications because of the I'm not going to say there is, but there is. I don't like the way they're utilized sometimes by the right or the left, but I know it's part of it. I know. Well, if I get people, especially students, anything, first of all, and you never quit, you never give up, you're given the opportunity to quit and be okay to quit a lot of times. Like we did. We saved life and health. And sometimes it may cost you your life, it may cost you an injury, or it may cost you your job. 
It cost us our jobs. We were, we were told we had to resign if we wanted to tell the truth. We did. It's, it's, what you, it's what you should do in your life. You should always give of yourself, especially the means sacrificing maybe something that you don't know. I did. But really what I want to get out of this, and, and this is selfish, I'm not for is I went to Yemen after the house. I took three months off from Yemen because I kept seeing the misrepresentation of what was going on. I kept feeling that we were being utilized as a tool also for certain politicians. And I also felt like the American people didn't really give a crap about us. It's like, screw this. I'll be honest, I hated this country. I'm out. I went to Yemen, and I worked in Yemen, and now they're just more tours. After eight months, we signed, we have signed multiple non disclosures. We were all sitting in the bar in Texas corner. And I remember Jack, he said, man, that's kind of tough. Because they didn't sign a non disclosure time when the war was there. Ah, that's kind of weird. And we decided then that we would vote. And if we voted as a team to do the story and tell them right to vote and tell the truth, we would do it. If anybody said no, we'd keep quiet. And we all voted yes. We did the vote. We started publishing, did the publishing, and then the publisher put us out and we had to do our media. <clears throat> I'm not used to that. Granted, obviously, you know now that I am, I'm used to being in front of the crowd. But initially, I wasn't. Because I was a very secret person for 15 years. Yeah, I lived in Nebraska, how long was the secret team to be? Well, we were out doing the media, and it was hard for me to keep telling the story and being on the news and still being subject to some of the pressures from being on CNN or Fox or being in the middle of the politics and getting the questions answered. And I, I went to <coughs> and I had a lady in Dallas Airport come up to me because I'm a really bad day. And uh, she goes, are you going to get out of here? I don't know how much. She goes, you're talking? She goes, I saw you on the news. She goes, I believe you guys. So you guys are telling the truth. Keep doing it. Keep telling the truth. And it just flips. I didn't, I didn't feel like I wanted to do something. <coughs> so, what I want people to do to get out of this, first of all, I want to say thank you, because these kind of groups of crowds, I've been speaking out for the last year, my process has been going since she had a freaking drill start, and I think I have to be something, I've got to be something about this tomorrow. <laughs> but I need it, and I love it, and I love seeing the support, because I feel like we have any support for all of you. Also, if you guys ever see a veteran, or see anybody that contracts with you, you, you just say thanks. And thank you for your service. Because you never know. You it's not a it's an artist you say why. You might be that one person that saves that person's life, that saves that person's life. So in closing, I always want to say first of all, thank you to your girl. Thank you for doing this for Glenn. I, I I can't even know what it was. I can't give questions. Glenn gave his life for this country. You guys doing this in scholarship, honoring him, especially in the education. Education for the college school is, is an outstanding show of support for contractors to land Navy SEALs and all of us that were our services. So thank you for that. And also, God bless you all. And thank you all for having me. This is a good for going out.